The Strategic Hot Box with Dr. Brandy Love Stankovic. Discussing leadership, business, and how to take control of your life and achieve greatness. From the streets of Las Vegas, energized, informed, and never diluted. It's time to kick some ass. Hey, it's your girl, Dr. Brandy Stankovic here, and today is a very special episode with a very important topic. We're going to discuss white allies for black lives. And we have three incredible individuals here with us today to provide their perspective. Dr. Tanya Bailey, Elaine Hardy, and Kelly Ellsworth Etchinson are going to be joining us here in just a second. Here on the Strategic Hot Box, as you know, we learn, we love, and we kick ass. And I'm excited to talk to some experts, ask questions, and learn how I, and maybe share some knowledge with you, can be better allies. I want to just start by saying I will never fully understand the impact of this year, of what's happening in this country, being the United States, and what it's having, the impact that it's having on the Black community. I recognize my privilege, and I am seeking to learn more and uncover any unconscious bias. I have dedicated my life and my career to inclusion. It is my passion. It is my purpose. And diversity is something perhaps maybe I've taken for granted. And living in a metropolitan city or even traveling as much as I have, um, or even starting my career in hip hop dance, for those of you that know that about me, I just feel like I've, I've taken this, this piece of me for granted, but only really in the last five years and blaringly in the last year has these, this systematic racism that is in our country, these inequities have become a complete game changer for me. And what is happening in our country cannot continue. A couple months ago, when Jacob Blake was shot, I didn't handle it well. And I know it's um, similar for all of you. And I could not wrap my head around it. The extreme excessive force, the unjust racism, the, the everything that, that it had occurred in the year, this year of scrutiny, what was everybody watching and after what had occurred with George Floyd and after Breonna Taylor. And, and there were so many people around and I watched that video over and over and it was in a neighborhood and there were people everywhere and there were babies in the car. Ugh. And I hit this point, I'm like, that is it. I have got to do something. I have this like, mama bear inside of me that wants to run around and protect all of my friends and i'm sure that sounds a little crazy but i've had it and so i've made a pact and i want to share that pact with you and we're going to dig into this topic but i also want to share a little story and i decided to talk to my boys about what happened to jacob blake and and i framed it like this and i don't know if this is the right way and i don't know if there is even a right way to talk about it but i said to them i called them in and i said imagine if you were at a barbecue and daddy took you to a barbecue and you were sitting outside and you were in the back of daddy's truck and you were strapped in and he was outside and he was talking to police officers and and maybe daddy was was being sassy and maybe he was being inappropriate to the police officers maybe he was yelling maybe he was being downright insubordinate and maybe he was in trouble by those police officers. But maybe when daddy was walking around to get into the front of the, the car, can you picture that? Like you in the back and him walking around the front of the car. And as daddy was trying to walk, get into the car, the police officer shot him seven times. Could you imagine how loud that would be? Can you imagine how scary that would be? You sitting in the back seat of a car and my kids are sitting there like, completely stunned and and just at this point emotional we're all emotional we're sitting there talking to each other and one of them's crying and the other one stops my younger um son stops and he looks at me and he's like wait a minute all confused and he looks at me he's like i thought black lives matter and i'm like yes baby yes they do and it's confusing as hell to me too and so my pact to you, my pact to me, my pact to this world is first, I will talk to my boys about equity, the beauty, diversity, and awareness. Make sure that they are aware of their privilege and educate this next generation about legacy and what legacy they can leave. And I, I urge all of you listening and watching to do the same. Second is I will continue to challenge my own systematic beliefs and inherent values, and I'll devote time to uncovering unconscious bias. And you should do the same. I will continue this conversation at work. I'll talk to my boss, my peers, my team. You do the same. 
Number four is I will, con I will question injustice every turn. You do the same. And number five, I'm gonna use my voice and influence to take a stand, just like this moment right here. You do the same. And considering that, I have asked some really brilliant individuals to come here and talk about a really vulnerable topic. And that's, can you help me as a, as a white person, can you help others, individuals to have a conversation around how can we help white people take a stand and, and not feel emotional and come across as a way to really, really help the world and really begin to understand. And they uh, uh, are, are the experts here and hopefully we'll provide some perspective in, in what we can do together because together we are stronger. And I'd like to, at this point, introduce you to them. First, we have Miss Dr. Tanya Bailey. She is a sought after conference speaker. She's a presenter, she's a coach, she's a trainer. She's a corporate consultant and executive advisor. And she's been doing that for over 20 years. She's very inspirational. She works with a lot of diverse organizations. She's got quite the passion. She's a creator of the Women in Power Summit. She hosts an inspirational uh, pot, a radio show, radio broadcast. And she's the first vice chair of Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and a leader advisor for the HIV AIDS nonprofit. Then we have Miss Kelly Ellsworth Etchinson. She's the Chief Marketing Officer and Chief Diversity Officer at LAFQ. She has more than 35 years of experience in, in financial services, and she facilitates diversity, equity, inclusion conversations, both in the community and in her organization. She's a fervent supporter of the YMCA and Metropolitan Lansing. She also has won a lot of awards, the Dora Maxwell Social Responsibility, the Crane Advocate of the Year, she's the NAACP Community Service Award, and the Sojourner Truth uh, Meritorious Award. And then finally, we have Elaine Hardy. She is the City of East Lansing's first appointed diverse, diversity, equity, and inclusion administrator, where she's responsible for leading the cities, and it's the 600 employees, a full cultural realignment. She's also serving as a commissioner with the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Commission of Mid-Michigan and a liaison with the government agencies concerning equal opportunity, equal employment opportunities. She also facilitates the City Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. And so I'd like to introduce you to my friends. Hello, welcome. Thank Hello. you all for being here. Hello there. Hello. Thanks for Hello. having us, Dr. B. So you guys didn't know I was going to hit you with such an emotional uh, start there <laughs> and the story of my baby. Sorry about that. It's okay. Thank you um, for that. All right. Yeah, yes. that was powerful. And thank you for being here and, and letting me ask questions and learn from you and all the listeners and watchers as well. And I'd love to start with the question of what does Black Lives Matter mean to you? And maybe if I could go to Elaine, what, what does it mean to you? and Why is it important? Well, first of all, Brandy, let me um, acknowledge that I am on lands that were ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. These were traditional and contemporary lands of the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Odawa people. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm here in their lands. And I have to um, take the question about what Black Lives Matter means to me in two parts. You know, that movement was started um, as a result of no justice for Trayvon Martin. And those founders understood the um, sentinel moment that we were in then as a country that there had to be a conversation around uplifting and respecting the humanity of Black people. And, and so I respect that movement. How Black Lives Matter translates to me as a woman of color, as a mother of brown sons, is this way. I believe that it is an affirmation of our humanity, but I also believe that is an, it is an anthem of the strength and the nobility of the people that we are. And I also believe that it is a clarion for this world to understand that individually, we as Black people matter and that our lives count, our stories count, our humanity counts, and we as a people are needed and necessary in this earth. Thank you for that. Kelly, Tanya, thoughts? Yes, um, thank you. I, um, when I think of Black Lives Matter and I hear people come back with all lives matter and absolutely all lives matter. 
And I want to embrace that statement that all lives matter. But right now, Black lives have not mattered for a long, long time in this country. And we're seeing it. I mean, we've lived it our entire lives, but now it's really unfolding before the rest of, of you that you can see what's happening and the injustices and all those things that are going on. And it takes me to a parable in the Bible when Jesus leaves the 99 and goes after that one lost sheep. You know, and the 99 is like, hey, don't we matter? And absolutely. And so this is what this mantra means. It's like um, the all lives do matter. White lives matter. But right now, white lives are good and have been good. Black lives are in trouble. And so we're saying, hey, what about us? You know, come in and in, 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 let's have some equality. Let's have, you know, some level playing field. Let's have um, the same rules apply to us that applies to everyone else. And so that's what that means uh, to me, that mantra means to me, all lives should matter, but right now all lives don't matter. And we just want to matter too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Kelly. And, and we have to matter. Um, and to just be frank and, and honest, we haven't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we haven't mattered. We haven't had a seat at the table. We haven't been in the table. We haven't uh, been invited to the room as often as we should. Um, and it's too sad that we have to say first black this, first black that, um, mm -hmm. because we're discounting that we are humans. But in this human race, we have not acknowledged nor have we um, accepted the fact that all that all lives matter, especially Black lives. We um, weren't always considered human. We were considered cattle, property, um, less important, insignificant. Uh, and so Black lives matter because we matter. Uh, my children matter. Um, uh, I, we, we deserve to be here. Um, and we're a part of this this uh, this American fabric, but it hasn't uh, always been recognized, nor appreciated, nor acknowledged mm -hmm. the way that it should. Yes, yes. So and ditto that, to that, all my sisters. <laughs> and, and that is a really a salient point, Doctor, because our history of 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 slavery in this country, the the way that we don't have honest conversations about how slavery dehumanized us and what the effects of that dehumanization has done and perpetuated over the centuries, we are not going to get to the end of it. We are not, we're, we're gonna always have to have a conversation of why, why Black Lives Matter if we don't have an honest, honest conversation about slavery in this country and the systemic inequalities that per, that, that system perpetuates. And I will hear different people or groups of people say that DEI initiatives, the Black Lives Matter mo like movement, it doesn't apply to me, that this diversity needs aren't in my community, or we're good, we're in this, this urban area and it's already diverse, we're fine. This doesn't apply to me. What do we say or what, what are our thoughts on that? Well, so my first say wake up. <laughs> We're like already <laughs> the chop at this one. <laughs> right. And and my first my first reaction, although it's uh, it's inartfully stated, is that you could have probably went to any forced labor plantation um, during slavery and found diversity. That doesn't mean that um, things are okay, right? It just means that there's diversity. My um, concern with um, the challenge of the work of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the, the work of Black Lives Matter movement when people um, discount it, really they're discounting humanity. And they're, they're discounting a, a, a part of the a, a American experience that um, America wouldn't be America without. You know, one of my, my, my most um, closely held sayings of Dr. King is that he said that we were all inextricably bound in a web of mutuality. And what affects one directly affects us all indirectly. So that's really why it matters because we don't really have a free and equal society if all of us are not free and equal. Mm -hmm. Yes, and when we think about when people say, I'm good, doesn't apply to me, 
I'm not racist. Why do I have to have this conversation? And my, my question back is, how has that worked so far for us as a nation? Uh, it has not worked. We, we all have unconscious biases. We all have, uh, uh, we're products of our environment, right? So the conversations we heard growing up from our grandparents, our uncles, our neighbors, uh, whatever that case may be. The mere fact that black people still do not have the full right to vote in this country, that it has to be signed, the amendment has to be signed back into law five years, the last president that signed it was President George Bush, means that uh, we need to have this conversation. And the fact that when you carve out, when you systematically carve out groups of people from the table, then our economy doesn't flourish like it should. That's why we, I, it, you're not good. When you say you're good, you're not good because our, our economy is not flourishing like it should. The, the fact that we still in this country have CEO roundtables means that there are people of color that are not at that table, bringing their energy, their talents to the yes. conversation, to the company, to the organization, to the neighborhood, to the communities, because uh, there are, you know, when you start bringing, having CEO roundtables and you have uh, uh, sectors that you're uh, invited to that table, like healthcare, and technology and financials and all of that, there are, I don't know how many black CEOs over healthcare. I don't know any. Uh, and so that means that you're, you're now excluding talent that can be brought. So when you say I'm good, you're, the mere fact that you say I'm good means <laughs> you're not good. Not paying attention, mm -hmm. yeah. Tanya? Oh, absolutely. Um, your question, how does it not apply to me or it doesn't apply to me um, automatically uh, significant, significantly dictates why it, it should matter. Uh, and mm -hmm. so for people to make that statement and individuals to feel as if it's their problem or that doesn't mm -hmm. involve what's happening in me, um, they're blind. And, and they, <laughs> I like to just say, <laughs> wake up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when I send my kids off to school, I don't send them off to school in a bubble. Uh, they're going to interface with your kids. When you come to the hospital uh, that I'm I'm overseeing or I'm on the board of directors for, you want the same kind of uh, care and quality as anyone else. And I think oftentimes we begin to just uh, silo ourselves because we really don't want to deal with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, it does apply. That's, that's really the answer to the question, but it mm -hmm. does, uh, not yes. that it doesn't. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we begin having this conversation, when the majority then is in an attempt to stand up for the minority, for those that, that do recognize this is a challenge, but those that want to break down these systematic barriers that are in place, it can be uncomfortable as a white person to be the person standing up. And I know from my perspective, this is what I believe in. I feel very passionate about it. I didn't even mean for the emotions to come out at the beginning of this, and it just does. It comes out of me. I have this, this mom inside of me. And yet, sometimes in these conversations, I, I get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to ever feel like it's self-congratulatory. And I don't want to overstep my place in this, in this journey. But I want to take action. So how do we, what advice do you have for white individuals that may feel the same way that I do, that, that where they can go from here, how to make them feel that they're, they should be a part of it, et cetera. Tanya, maybe you start us off on this one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, yeah, I, I appreciate your, your, your opening and, and your mm -hmm. passion. I think oftentimes um, my white uh, colleagues, friends, and, and just the white community um, don't often understand how powerful that their privilege and voice is. And, and acknowledging privilege is so important, especially now, because mm -hmm. uh, people of color haven't had it. So let's just be real, right? Uh, and so I think one of the ways that, that we make sure that they know that they're an ally and that they're welcome to this conversation is, is for them to understand, first of all, you, you've already been a, con a part of the conversation from the beginning until now. Um, and uh, ensuring that, number one, um, it doesn't have to be a safe conversation and they're supposed to feel uncomfortable because this is messy. 
Diversity, mm -hmm. equity, inclusion is messy, it's layered, it's emotional, it's all of that in between. Um, mm -hmm. And if, you, if you've ever cooked in a kitchen, at any point, then you know you, you have to have a lot of different ingredients ingredients going. You got smoke going, you got fire. It's all of that and then some. Uh, and so I think we have to not um, or even push toward the effort of it needs to be comfortable for others. It's supposed to be uncomfortable because we've mm -hmm. had over 400 years plus of uncomfortableness. Um, I can't take off my skin. <laughs> I can't. I can't do anything about all of this. Here it is. You got it right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when when we come with our full selves, as we're all should be entitled to do, no matter what spaces and places that we um, that, that we uh, introduce ourselves to, we should be able to be that authentic self. And, and to do that, we have to make sure uh, that all, including our white allies, including white individuals, understand that they have a voice at the table, but also they have to make sure that they recognize their presence. They're coming with privilege. They're coming with more uh, information and more resources oftentimes than others. Yeah. And I, I like that the, that the way that you frame that in at first recognizing the privilege at first coming to it with the right frame and saying, hey, if you're uncomfortable, you're probably in the right place for this. Yes. Uh, Kelly, thoughts? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with Dr. Tanya. That's one of my mantras. I tell people, hey, you, you are going to be uncomfortable. And guess what? That's OK. We're going to get through this my entire life. And so uh, that, as Dr. Tanya says, being uncomfortable means you are in the right place, but we can't sugarcoat this. And this has been painful. We have lost lives. We have lost opportunities. We have lost jobs. We have lost housing opportunity. So this is going to be uncomfortable. And so um, I had a conversation recently with one of my fellow colleagues um, out of Wisconsin. And she's a white lady that's um, over the marketing division and her credit union. And she had a billboard up and someone put some graffiti art around the bottom of that billboard that had George Floyd's name that covered up the credit union's logo. And she decided to take it one step further, renew the contract with the outdoor billboard company and move it to a more prominent area. And I called her up and said, hey, I want to meet you. Let's talk. I, you're my hero. Thank you for doing that. What <laughs> career that was. And so when talking with her, she said exactly that, Brandy. She says, I felt like I didn't know if I should do that. Did I have the right to do that? And mm -hmm. so not a rule book in how to show up in this conversation. And just we just got to show up. It's kind of like, you know how uncomfortable you get when your spouse comes home and is like, we need to talk. And you're like, oh, Lord. <laughs> it's that. It's like, we, we just need to talk. And there's going to be some crying. There's going to be some hurt feelings. It's going to be some things not said right. As my mother said, I can't always say things to hit your ears just right. It's going to be all of that. But then you start to heal. And then you can get to the other side. But you got to start somewhere. And we mm -hmm. want our white allies. We cannot solve this racial problem alone. People right. cannot hear the messenger. And so we need our white allies at the table with us to have this conversation. And so get over the uncomfortableness, because it like like Dr. Tanya said, it's not messy. But look at that meal when you're done cooking in the kitchen and you get the kitchen cleaned up, the meal is good. And so it's gonna be good. Elaine. And I was I was just gonna add that the place where you begin is where you are, right? So if, if you don't have information, go get information. If you don't have relationships with people in communities of color, that's a good place to start too. And when you show up, be, be ready, right? Be ready to understand that you may have to accept some humility and that there won't be a place for um, people to blame you because we understand an authentic heart. And if you come with an authentic expression and an authentic belief that you want to be a part of this movement, a part of this change, you'll get work done. And I have to echo what everyone says. This is messy, uncomfortable work. And it's going to be messy and uncomfortable for a while. Even when we make ground, we also have to recognize is that we're not gonna bring everybody with us. 
right? And when we recognize that everyone's not going to come along, everyone's not going to be in agreement or high-fiving us or thinking that Black Lives Matter or that it's important to have equity at work and ha have uh, a diverse workforce, when we recognize that we can't bring everybody along, but we can do the work that's before us right now, we'll get a lot done. We, we'll get a lot done. And how do you, where do you start in a conversation? Do you actually approach conversations around Black Lives Matter or DEI in general differently based upon the, the audience? So would you have a conversation differently with a white audience versus a Black audience or community? See, I'm, we, we, may, we, may, okay. we may diverge on this point because I do. I mean, I, you have to read the room. There's, there's no, there's no way that I'm going to go in with kind of a full conversation about becoming anti-racist and talking about systemic racism and structures of racism and, and, and diversity. And a person has no idea what the difference between equity and equality are. So you have mm -hmm. to read the room. You have to understand the audience that you're speaking to. You should always tell the truth though. And it's important that we um, not shy away from the truth about Black Lives Matter and the truth about why we even need to have diversity, equity, and inclusion administrators or officers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that um, as well. I, I think that you start the conversation uh, with education, no mm -hmm. matter who's in the room. Um, because education is the key. You started with education and you can't go through assumptions uh, that people know because obviously so sometimes they don't. Um, and it's just it's just a reality and they don't have to um, they don't have to be wrong for that. It's just a reality. Uh, so you start with education and, and you also uh, remove to the next phase. And, and that is a, a deeper understanding of that or a comprehension of that uh, education that you're getting. Um, and I think you make sure that you have multiple voices uh, in those conversations as best as possible um, from a variety of spectrums so that Absolutely. there is there is uniformity there there is um, almost a coming together um, but but I believe it, it starts with, edu with with education yes, and it, it has does. to end in action um, and, and that action doesn't have to be um, a, a collaborative we hold hands together but it's more so an action that we individually take uh, racism was something that was uh, that that's been constructed so it can be deconstructed yes. but, but it has to be something that we all collectively and individually work toward once we have that education yes and the only thing i would add to that brandy is there are there are two different conversations absolutely so when i have in conversations with black people for instance we have a shared language and a shared understanding and shared experiences. We, while our experiences may be different, may look a little different, but they are shared. But when I'm speaking with uh, a group of all white people, I try to start out just by de-arming everyone and letting them know we all have unconscious biases, including myself, because it's all environmental, it's how we raise the neighborhoods, the things we've been exposed to or not exposed to. So I try to like kind of that and, and say that this is a no, no judgment zone because until we know better, we can't do that. But once we know better, we can do better. And so sometimes people just don't know. I've had people come to me after we've had conversations and say, I'm sorry, I had no idea. Thank you for sharing that. And so I have brought along with me some very unlikely Allies, when I say unlikely, is just people I just never would have thought, but it's like jumped on the band with, you know, hook, line, and sinker. And that's beautiful. But like Elaine says, not everyone's going to come along. But conversation is absolutely different depending on your audience. And do, are there some common mistakes? And obviously, we don't want to be make too any broad generalizations of any particular group or uh or demographic by any means but are there some common mistakes that white people make in, in these conversations that we can combat by offering some advice oh, I, sure, yeah. uh, for, yeah. first of all i don't think it's appropriate for white people to say i can't breathe right that you, that <laughs> that shouldn't be something that that you say or um i think there's obviously a, a, a slew of terms uh and phrases that 
um, to be sensitive is one thing, but to be ignorant um, and arrogant is another. And so I think mm -hmm. it's it's uh, important um, for all of uh, all of my white um, uh, partners and and colleagues to understand how important it is that one that their voice does matter. So it, it needs to be in the conversation. Um, I had a, a session that I did um, recently, and um, a white male um, just came out and disclosed. I'm, I'm really thankful. He says that my kids aren't aren't black. And mm -hmm. everyone in the room went, oh, and I went, yay, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> because we're getting to the real conversation. Um, right. And and I, I celebrated um, his his values and, and and his his opinions at that moment. But I knew he wasn't going to live there forever mm -hmm. because after mm -hmm. education and information, there there is a transformation that happens. And, and mm -hmm. in the sessions that I've been in, I think we try to make it comfortable. Uh, for individuals to be able to share their truth as well as their ignorance. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are there are key phrases and, and things. And sometimes I think people wanting to be an ally and wanting to uh, share that they're down you know, for the cause, um, they end up misstepping. But I think letting mm -hmm. folks know you're not going to say everything right. It's okay. Mm -hmm. You're going to get it wrong. It's yeah. okay. That's the messiness. That's the layer. That's the emotional. And be okay mm -hmm. with that. Be okay, mm -hmm. uh, understanding that it, you may not say it right, but you're talking, and that's where the conversation mm -hmm. and the change begins to happen. Yeah, and, and I, I would think add. Oh, go ahead, Elaine. No, I just also say I just think it's important that you do the work yourself too. Like you, you have to educate yourself. And there are some really amazing resources out there. I mean, um, the guidelines for being strong white allies um, really kind of just gives you these. Um, very, um, I, I think, um, important nuggets of information about, you know, how you come into a space to work in this um, uh, in this equity work or in the movement of Black Lives, that, that you come there and you'll be ready to listen, right? That you mm -hmm. find out about brown people and black people and about the movement. And you show up in ways that may not necessarily be comfortable for you initially. And I think that understanding that part of the the beauty of being able to articulate your desire to be a ally is just your heart about it. Brandy, what happened at the beginning of this um, podcast was so powerful for me. Your story mm -hmm. about how uh, the shooting affected you and how you bravely went and talked to your children and your family if you tell that story to black and brown people and they hear that emotion and that disbelief and that anger and that, God, I want to do something about this, that's the start of an amazing relationship, right? That's the start of, of somebody you know that understands that we all are impotent in times like that and that they want to do something to help. So showing up with that authenticity, authentic, showing up authentic like that matters. Yeah, and, and the thing I would add too, when you ask about, are there any mistakes when, you know, that white people might make in having these conversations? I would think, so typically we've always been like um, proper, right? In the workplace and don't bring up, you know, religion or politics in the workplace, but, for me, you cannot have real, meaningful, in-depth, uh, life-changing DEI conversation without politics in, in, it, in the conversation. I touched on it a little bit earlier in this podcast on voting rights. Uh, the fact that we are in this situation, that we have systemic ra uh, racism, we have housing discrimination, we have all of these things, and now we have all these laws that's supposed to combat these things, but they're not held accountable to enforcing them, all comes down to policy. And so when people come into these conversations and the minute you may say something that is uh, opposite of their political party affiliation, whatever that may be, uh, they get uncomfortable or they may even get pissed. But the bottom line is uh, we have policies that need to be changed and we have to have conversations on what those issues, what the wrongs are, and how we write them. And, and so when people come into these conversations, they need to understand that it will be messy, but don't 
think that we're going to have proper um, conversation, all really politically, <laughs> don't hurt anyone's feelings. Okay. Because, as I said earlier, I've been uncomfortable my whole entire life. But we've learned as Black people to adapt. Um, we've been a cheerful chameleon. We can walk in a room and we just adapt. But until white people start to, almost every room they go into, uh, they are the only ones, um, then they mean that means that they need to show up at the table. Wherever we go places, when I go to a networking event, when I go to a you know, nice restaurant here in my community, when I go anywhere, most times I'm the only one, or maybe there's one or two others. But white people don't know, they don't experience that. They experience it maybe once or twice in a lifetime, but they don't yes. experience it on a daily basis. Right. And so getting people to understand that um, there's gonna be some mix of things that we've never ever mixed before in the workplace when we have these conversations, um, but it has to happen because we have to have policy change. And you can't po change policy without talking about the policy, that's the broken exactly policy. Right. That's, a, that's exactly right. Exactly so what right. does it look like then to stand up if uh, paint the picture of what it looks like for someone to stand up? Dr. Tanya, what does that look like? Yeah, well, I, I think, first of all, it looks like the opposite of shrinking. Right. <laughs> um, it, it looks it, it looks uh, it looks very bold and powerful. Um, it looks as if um, there's a melting pot. Uh, of, of more voices coming forward to the forefront, adding and lending. It looks like everyone lifting um, the mantle, not just one or two. Um, it's, it looks inspiring, right? Uh, it looks like real change and not just rhetoric. Uh, and so when we stand up, it, it, it looks very, very opposite of what it would look like as if, as if we were shrinking or sinking beneath our our human call our human purpose and so i think when when we stand up i think we see change i i think we see the uh the eraser erasing eracism i think we, we we see more unity um more love definitely peace um and we see a whole new world uh that our heroes like John Lewis and uh, Malcolm X and others only dreamed about, only hoped for. I, I, I believe we will see a reality of who we are supposed to be when we all grow up. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I, I think standing I, up, oh, I'm sorry. No, go for it. I was just gonna say, I think standing up is really, um, you know, particularly when we are talking about white, white allies, it, it could be small things and big things. You know, I was I was um, blown away um, hearing my city manager talk about the murder of George Floyd. And I just want that to sit with you for a minute because here is a city manager that's in charge of the police department who has to look at union police officers and police administration who may have had a different thought or belief about what happened to Mr. Floyd, but he called it a murder, right? He said it was a murder. And in his um, reflections and thinking about Mr. Floyd's murder, he decided that he had to do something about it. And he wasn't really sure what that something looked like, but he decided to just start it moving forward with the idea of saying, we have got to get our employees in this place where they understand that that was not okay. Like there could be never an excuse to be made for what happened to Mr. Floyd. And he acted on it. And that's what standing up looks like. But it's also in those small things, like when I was in a meeting and I walked into a room and I was a couple of minutes late and one of the white gentlemen in the room pointed out, yeah, well, you know, she was gonna be late. And a white lady in the room said, well, how did you know that she was going to be late? Every meeting I come to with her, she's on time. She's always here. We don't have any idea why she was, why she was late. And I, I didn't, 
I didn't even know what to say because I was I was just gonna just take it right. I was just gonna say, you know what, I'm not even getting ready to explain to him that I got stopped in the hall by a constituent who wanted to talk about. I wasn't even gonna go there with him. I was just gonna take it. But she stood up for me, and that's what standing up looks like. It's bold steps, and it's those small steps too. Yes, and I would agree. And the other thing is um, actually having those hard conversations with your loved ones. So when you hear Uncle Danny um, using a racial slur or telling an off-color joke that you say, hey, that's, that's not acceptable. Um, so whereas before you may have let your grandparents slide because you didn't want to say anything that might you know, hurt them or any of that, now is the time for us to, not in a mean way, not in a disrespectful way, but being able to actually say to our loved ones when we're having our private conversations at our family meal and you're hearing things that are being said inappropriately, that you actually call that out. And that's gonna be what standing up also looks like. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. And drawing a line and being comfortable drawing that line. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what is it then, if we could, send all the listeners and watchers away with a bold action or a kick-ass takeaway, what would it be? <laughs> Kelly, let's start with you. What's a bold action or kick-ass takeaway? I, I just go back to being able to um, call out what is wrong. And um, Ben Franklin you know, has a quote about uh, justice will not be served until those unaffected are as outraged as those that are. And so being outraged when someone steps over and crosses that line and having the courage to call them out. And so that, even if it's just one saying, hey, the very next time I hear someone say, say this, I'm going to stand up and say, no, that's not acceptable. So starting somewhere um, would be very helpful to start there. Elaine? I believe that all of the isms exist and particularly racism exists because we have forgotten that to respect the humanity of others. And the way that you um, begin to understand and respect someone's humanity is that you befriend them, you get to know them. So I would encourage every white person, if you can go through your whole week without ever having any contact, except maybe at work or seeing a black person or a brown person in the grocery store, but they're not a part of your inner circle. They're not a part of your friend group. They're not a part of who you are. I would just, for you, I would challenge you to take the bold step and go get to know somebody brown. I mean, you can start off with building a friendship with someone at work, but I think that it's those relationships, building those relationships and creating that commonality of us and understanding that we're all, we are the same, right? We, I think that that will take us a long way. So my, my bold move is to go get you a black friend, for real. <laughs> yes. For real, for real. For real. And I'm, I'm taking I'm, applications then, I guess, for real. <laughs> I'll be your friend. But I, 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 would, I would just, uh, thank you. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, and, and I hope some of your listeners will as well. Um, I, I appreciate um, what everyone has said. And I think one of the things that I think is a bold, you said kick ass, uh, so I'm going to say it with you, uh, move is to say or ask this question, how can I help? Mm -hmm. It's simple. It's easy. Um, we can all say it and we can mm -hmm. all respond to it. How can I help? Um, none of us, none of us individually um, have the magic ingredient to addressing the woes and issues that have historically kept us divided. But together, um, each of us also asking, how can I help? Regardless of what your melatonin looks like, regardless mm -hmm. of what your experiences have been, how can, I, how can I help you understand more about my experience? Mm -hmm. How can I help you understand this particular um, disparity? How can I just be a help? Uh, that to me is bold. That's kick ass. That is doing the work. That is being responsible, accountable, being an ally. 
how can I help? Really simple and easy for us all to walk away to do and something we can do right now. Right now. Right now. I love it. You guys have got me so inspired. I have the chills. I think this conversation needs to be had over and over again. I know everyone listening is going to say they can't, it can't be close to done already, but I want to, to move quickly with a couple really fast questions and just top of mind and to answer as quickly as we can. And we'll, so I'm going to ask you a question of if I could, I would blank every day. If I could, I would blank every day. Dr. Tanya? I would transform. I would transform into a better person every day. I, I would transform to help more, to lend more, to be an example, to help all my eight kids. I, I would transform to being better than the day before, if I could. Love it. Elaine? If I could... <laughs> Gosh, that is such a loaded place. I, there's so many things that came to my mind. But if I if I could forgive deeper every day, mm. if, if I could find some place in me every day to 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 be bold enough to forgive more every day, I that's what I would do. Wow, that's a good one. Kelly. I would say if I could um, do something every day, it would be be intentional about whatever it is that you want to do. So whether it's being a kinder person, uh, being, uh, like Elaine said, a more forgiving person, trying something new, be intentional about, as Tanya said, transforming you. Last week, I took up something brand new. I, for years, I used to sell art on the side. And now, last week, I actually took up art, like actually painting. And I've painted, <laughs> painted four pieces in a week. And so just being intentional to be your best self. Get to know. Well, you guys are amazing. I think that that is so far beyond what I was thinking because my answer to that question is if I could, I would eat tacos every single day. <laughs> Me <going>. too. <laughs> Me I too. like that. Me too. Yep. Just, Ditto. Just then. Um, all right. Brandy, I, dig, Brandy, I dig your, Brandy, I dig your courage and I appreciate you being an ally and keep standing yes. up and being an example because we need you and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. If people wanted to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Elaine, do you want to start us off? I'm easy to find. If you Google Elaine Hardy East Lansing, Everything about me comes up, literally, even my cell phone number. But you can reach me at ehardy at cityofplanting.com. Excellent. And Kelly? Uh, the same. You can certainly Google Kelly Ellsworth Etchison, or you can email me at K-E-L-L-S-W-O-R-T-H at LaughQ, which is L-A-F as in Frank, C-U dot com, and you'll get right to me. And, and of Tanya. course, yes, you can reach me uh, at tanyabailey.com. You can also email me uh, at drtcbphd um, at gmail.com. We would love to connect with you, love to hear your thoughts, love to come and uh, see what you're doing and how I can help transform and be a part of your transformation. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you being willing to have this conversation with me. Thank you so much. And uh, I just, everything that we talked about today is going, is going to inspire so many because I know that it did me and I appreciate you, you sharing your thoughts. So thank you. And I hope to see you thank guys you. soon. All thank right. You. Bye. 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 Let's head out to our shout out. I'm John from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm here with Brandy and I'm listening at Hotbox. <laughs> Thank you to John, my friend John from Naivasha. I actually met him in Naivasha, Kenya, and he's from Nairobi. So thank you for sending a shout out our way. And thank you again to our friends, Elaine, Kelly, and Dr. Tanya. 
what an amazing conversation. I feel like, oh, I'm going to be thinking about this one for a very long time. And we appreciate everybody uh, for listening and being a part of it. So let's head out and do some kick-ass takeaways. And we had so much that, had, that came out of today. Let's take it down into our top three. So as you learn to become a better ally, number one, have unabashed commitment. That is all out, unforgiving commitment to this being right. This is what you wanna be standing up for. This is what you wanna do. Unabashed commitment to the cause. Number two, get uncomfortable. Every single one of them said, it, you gotta get uncomfortable. That anybody that's in the place similar to me, anybody that is not of the, the minority group, anybody that's of the majority, anybody that's, that's having a conversation around it is going to be uncomfortable. And it is the conversation you need to get uncomfortable in order to create change. And number three, take every opportunity every time and what i mean by that is do not to do not kind of go in our shells and, and make choices not to do it no when you have the chance to speak up speak up when you have the chance to stand up stand up when you have the chance to use the privileges that you have even privileges based on the color of your skin use them i want to use the voice voice and influence that i have for good to be able to speak to people like you and, and, and that, that are watching and listening on amazing topics like this, to hear from amazing subject ex experts that we, subject matter experts that we heard from today. So every opportunity, every time. That's our top three kick ass. Thank you again to Elaine, Kelly, and Dr. Tanya. And as always, we'd love to hear from you on any other topics that you want us to tackle here on the Strategic Hot Box. Hit us up on any questions that you have out of today's episode or future topics that you want to hear on the website, strategichotbox.com, or Facebook, Twitter, at Brandy Love, B-R-A-N-D-I-L-U-V, or Instagram at Strategic Hot Box, or at Brandy Love, or you can email us, podcast at Strategic Hot Box. So until I see you again, Get out there and kick some ass.